This is The Ramsey Show. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, it's The Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. We help people build wealth, do work that they love, create actual amazing relationships. We're here to help you do all of that. Rachel Cruz, Ramsey personality, number one best-selling author, and my daughter is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. That's 888-825-5225. Dakota is with us to start this hour in San Antonio. Hi, Dakota. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Thank you so much for taking my call. Sure. What's up? So I wanted to see if I could get a little bit of guidance from y'all. Um, I live with my boyfriend and we have a baby together, um, but we do not have our finances combined. Um, I bring debt into our relationship. He does not have any debt. Um, so I'm currently working on the baby steps um, using the snowball and um, have been trying to knock that out. But we do have quite a few shared finances. Um, like we pay for my 50, 50 for my daughter's daycare, 50, 50 for rent, groceries, all that stuff. So we're constantly like Venmoing or writing each other checks or things like that to reimburse. And so I was just going to see, do you recommend continuing to keep our finances separate until I knock out the rest of our debt of my debt? Or should we go ahead and combine them to make our everyday expenses easier? So Dakota, why, why don't y'all just get married? Um, because I have a lot of guilt about having the debt and I want to knock it out before we get married. <laughs> so you're waiting for marriage to pay off your debt? Yes. Okay. I would, encur- I would encourage you, I would not wait. I wouldn't wait. And I would encourage people who want to get married not to, they don't have to wait. I think even having a baby, you don't need to wait to have a baby till you're debt free. Uh, that this debt, I wouldn't say, I think that's, that's a... That's kind of a separate thing. I know why, what makes you feel guilty about it. Just the fact that you guys would combine finances when you get married and you are going to take you guys backwards. Is that it? Right. Yeah. And um, he does have like a much larger income than I do. And so I just would hate for there to be any like resentment or animosity about um, me bringing in debt when he doesn't have any. Has he kind of alluded to that? Is that a little bit of kind of his mo or is that are you um, playing that tape in your head just out of yourself probably more of the latter yeah he's never eluded hey, to any... yeah hey, yeah dakota how old are you i am 26 okay um this guy's in love with you you have a baby with him you sleep with him you live with him and you're trying to figure out how to combine incomes and combine everything but do all of that without combining the debt. Too late. That ship has sailed. Rachel's right. I'm going to put my old man arm around you and give you a hug and say, <laughs> honey, best thing for that baby, best thing for this man, best thing for you is get married and then combine your incomes, combine your lives, combine everything, join it together so tight that it cannot be torn asunder and then go live a beautiful, glorious life. Okay. And getting out of debt's part of the adventure. Raising the child is part of the adventure. Uh, waking up and looking at him when he starts to lose his hair is part of the adventure. <laughs> okay. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for your help. And then, see, here's the problem. It's legally and relationally very difficult to financially play house when you're not married. Because you get into this argument over the mustard, who bought the mustard, and yet you're in the same bed. It's just, it's, right. it's, it's so inconsistent and incongruent. It's just weird and awkward. And that's just a part of the, the, the system that you're using is all. And it's not a judgment thing. You didn't hear judgment in our voices. We just want good things for you. We, we, right. love, we love you and we love that baby and we want you guys to have a wonderful life. And so um, I, I, I would um, take that t- 
tape out of your head and I would wad it up and throw it away that somehow you've done something wrong by bringing the debt to the table. For God's sakes, baby is a 10. Debt is a one on a scale of one to 10. Okay. Relationship Marriage is a 10. Is Marriage a ten. is a yeah. 10. Mm-hmm. On, on a, debt is a small thing. If you're both in agreement that debt, this debt is a bad thing and we're going to clear it as fast as we can using all of our combined marital incomes and assets yeah. and so that we can have a wonderful, glorious life for this baby and as a couple, then you're going to knock that debt out so fast it's silly and uh, it's blocking you from having your best possible, wonderful, glorious life. Yeah, it's hard to work as a team when you're legally not a team and you're having to go around yeah. all this stuff. So it's just you hard. Guys it's are hard doing to, great. It's hard, it's hard to do finances with your roommate. It just is. It's just it's it's it, yeah. You know, you can't act like you're married with your finances when you're acting like you're married with every other part of your life. It's just it's so awkward and weird, and it's hard. And I'm not saying you're awkward and weird. I'm just saying this is the way it works. It's very difficult. Hey, thanks for the call. Very, very good question. You know, a, a lot of people uh, living together that aren't married have that exact question. We've had it over the years yeah. a lot. Um, the other issue is is that there's all kinds of data out there in the world, and this is not for Dakota, but this is just generally on this discussion, that um, th- they call it the poverty cycle or the poverty indicators that the, there's about three or four poverty indicators that if you get if you have a baby before you're married again not not messing with Dakota here but I'm just giving you the poverty poverty indicators uh, if you um, uh, get married before graduate from high school or uh, or start living with someone before you graduate from high school uh, if um, you know and we keep going on the levels of education uh, all these different things all of these things are indicators that that you know, you're 90% more likely, I have to pull the study up, I can't remember the details, but you're 90% more li- likely to live before the poverty level, below the poverty level, mm-hmm. if you don't do these things that are really social indicators of what's going on in your life. Because what happens is it's very difficult to prosper fin- financially when you're 17 years old with a baby. Yeah, well, that for sure. Of, yeah, kind of but I think even more than that, the stuff that I've seen in research within the marriage aspect of the rate of divorce is higher of those that live together. That, yeah. So for marriage. me, I'm like, you know, there's there's a um, probably a spiritual conviction that that we have with this. But they're also after over the years of seeing people do this, like you said, just kind of playing house. There's a commitment level there in a marriage that has to be there. Um, and it affects your outcome and, financially. Yes. And when it's not there. Right. And that's what I'm saying is like the, the, the tentacles play in. It's just like when people come in with a with a marriage a money question about marriage. So well, my spouse won't get on the same page. The tentacles are just the money, but there's so much underneath that. And so pressing this generation, it sounds great. Oh, well, I'll see if we like each other enough to live together. The living together is, is a small portion of it. It is, it's the marriage commitment that you, that, that is the greatest weight. And that weight has been taken away from this generation is what it feels like to me. Yeah. Yeah. It's now you're sounding like an old person <laughs> from this generation. I know. Don't worry about this generation. I've been married for 12 years. Don't worry about this generation. Unbelievable. Those (laughs) Gen Zers. Those little puppies. Oh, God bless them. (laughs) This is The Ramsey Show. So excited, Orlando. We hope you're ready. We're going to be down there a week from Thursday on May the 19th for our Building Wealth live event. If you haven't gotten your seats yet, you're missing out. There's only about 3,000 seats, and we have sold almost 3,000. You can still get tickets. Going to be an action packed night. George Camel, Rachel Cruz, Dr. John Deloney, Ken Coleman, and I are hosting this real event. 
in person, human beings in a room, building wealth live event. And Dr. John Deloney and Ken Coleman will be doing a free bonus session about work and relationships before the main event. Afterwards, everybody will be signing books and taking pictures and hanging out, meeting you guys. We're so excited to do this. Tickets are only $25 each, Orlando, one week from this coming Thursday, May the 19th. You can bring your friends. It's only $60 for a four pack. That's four people for 15 bucks a head. This is a deal. It's going to be a lot of fun. And then this fall, we're going to be in Phoenix, in Sacramento, in Minneapolis, and in San Antonio. All of those have sold almost 2,000 tickets already. And the event, the event venues uh, range from two to 3,000 people So, if you, uh, in terms of what they hold. So if you want to come to any of those, even in the fall, I suggest you go ahead and get them done. Those are in September 13th, November 1st, 10th, and 15th are, is the fall tour. It's going to be a lot of fun. Rachel, Las Vegas the other night was on fire. Oh, it was so fun. So fun. They were a great crowd. They, they were, and it was... Orlando, I, you're going to have to bring it to keep up with Vegas. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, and the, it would always shocks me, which happens all, all the events, but since we just haven't done one, I feel like in years... It feels the, like 20 years. The yeah. amount of um, traveling that people do, you know, around. So lots of people from LA and Orange County and, I mean, all, you know, um, now, the regions right around Vegas there. Vegas like it's a suburb, though. It's not that far, right? I know, they do, yeah. Yeah, they but anyways, it was, it was so fun. But yeah, great they, people, great people. Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. We had a, just under 3,000 folks there, just over 3,000, something like that. It was a big audience laughing and uh, carrying on together. And it's just good to be around people that have good sense. And, man, our <laughs> audiences are just, they're good people. I mean, they we, are. We they're great people. We don't have a bunch of crazies in our audiences. They're good folk. And uh, they, they just want to get better. They want to do better. They want to be around other people. It kind of normalizes wisdom. Yeah. You know, because there's so so little wisdom in our culture today. So, uh, yeah, come hang out with the real people. Yeah. <laughs> it's, the crazies are all on TV. Oh, my gosh. It's nuts. All right. Zach is with us. Zach's in Atlanta. Hi, Zach. How are you? Good. How are you? Better than I deserve. What's up? Uh, so, quick question. I have uh, about $8,500 in credit cards between two credit card debts mm-hmm. and a vehicle with, with a vehicle with 23000 which is paid for through my company every month. So, that's kind of besides the point. But No, it's not besides the My question is, okay, well, I, I, I got you. But the, the, the main reason I was calling was should I combine the two credit cards and get a personal loan? with a lower interest rate to pay off the credit cards. Okay. What do you make? Uh, 65. Okay. Thousand. Well, we teach folks, Zach, if you uh, are new to our stuff, to be extremely intense, unbelievably focused, cut your lifestyle to nothing, scorched earth, no life, yeah. until you clear these yeah. debts. Have you heard that stuff said by Ramsey people before? Oh, absolutely. Um, okay. That's why I've been okay. listening to you lately. Now, yes, given that as our scenario, making 65000 how fast are you going to pay off 8500 Uh should be fast. Well, what's fast? Uh, if I if I do the budget of that, like I'm, I'm working on, which the first month didn't go as planned, mm-hmm. like I'll talk about um, six months. Okay, good. All right. And so really what we're discussing with your question then is interest rate on $8,000 for six months. 10% change for one year would be an $800 change. So a 10% change in interest rate by getting a different loan on 8500 is a $400 swing. Follow me? All right. Okay. Yes, sir. And $400 is nice. If you send it to me, Rachel will cash the check. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But the, uh, you, you see, four, but here's my, here's my yeah. point. Okay. The reason we're doing this mm-hmm. math out is this. It's okay to do what you're talking about doing. The problem mm-hmm. with it is it makes you feel like you did something. Right. But you still have the debt. <laughs> well, yeah. You, you, what you did was $400 and you don't have right. a $400 problem. You have a $31,000 problem. Right. And so, 
you know, so and so you've you already ascertained, you, listen, you're, you're already ahead of the curve because you've already figured this out. I'm doing my budget. Didn't work right the first month. I'm learning how to do this. I'm building new muscles that I didn't have before. You're on, you're on track to be winning with this, Zach. You're very impressive. So, but what I'm pointing out is, is that the math says the important thing to work on is living on nothing and paying this debt off super fast because that's $8,000 in six months. The uh, question you asked about is $400 in six months. So if you only do the $400 change, you didn't do anything. Right. You do the $8,000 change and you don't do the $400 change, you're still out of debt. Right. So you're so the secret another- sauce, not the interest rate. Because it's such a short right. term and it's such a short, short, small amount of money in general as in the scope of your life. And where you're going to see the momentum, Zach, is not just in the math, which is what we're doing, right? To so the idea of taking, well, should I just take a personal loan to you know, combine the credit cards and just have one loan with lower interest. All that's like a it's math talk. But when you get in that change of, wow, I am, I am literally sacrificing my lifestyle. I am saying no to things and I'm throwing money at it. That's the momentum. That's what's going to get you to win yeah. long term and to pay this off. It's not going to yeah. be the math. And you can do that. And that's the problem is I think we get so caught up in the math when we think about money. So your question is not... Um, invalid because it's like, oh yeah, that makes sense if we're just talking about math, but we're not talking about math. In order to completely change the way you handle money and to build wealth over the long term, it's your behavior that changes. And so by you saying this little math of four hundred dollars, I don't even I'm not even gonna mess with because I'm gonna focus so much on what I can do and changing, you know, your budget, putting money away and I mean going through the baby steps, that's where you're gonna see a lot of so, the right. progress. I so sense I, I, I sense that you're be making more than the minimum payments that I have been. Right. That's if right. you're gonna keep right. the that's debt if you were gonna keep the debt for five years, then it would be a big deal to get the personal loan. Right. But you're not. Right. So yeah, so you you're already convinced, but let me keep teaching our audience with your example, okay? Um, the uh, the other thing is this the words that we use, all of us reveal what is going on in our heart and you said something very interesting that i want you to think about uh, because personal finance is behavior more than it is math you said i want to get a personal loan to pay off my two credit cards well you're really not paying them off you're just moving them to a personal loan so a proper way of saying it would have been hey i want to move my debt over to a different kind of debt to get a lower interest rate but i'm going to pay off my debt with extremely low lifestyle and a debt snowball, and that's how I'm going to pay off the debt because you can't borrow right, so. your way out of debt. And so that's a lesson for the rest of our audience because people say that all the time. I'm going to pay off my debt by borrowing this. No, you didn't pay it off. You just moved it. And so, again, so all think, this uh, to say. I think, the budget, I think the budget would be the first step before I'm even worried about doing the personal loan, evidently, because yeah, the budget yeah. didn't work the first month. That's right. Month. Yeah, that's let's, right. let's get going and really get some momentum on, on pounding that 8,500 in the mouth. Just beat the snot out of it, right? And then when, right. You, get the, then when you get that moving, like you're saying, uh, if you want to do the personal loan and save $400, like I said, that's, that's good. There's nothing wrong with $400. But if you feel like that got you out of debt, then you were mathematically mm-hmm. wrong. What gets you out of debt is Zach looking in the mirror and go, hey, Bubba, we're changing <laughs> that's a big deal and paying off that smallest credit card first by keeping them separate gives you that momentum as well of like okay i can do this it's actually working and it keeps you fueled yeah that's versus true. one one big loan that's true you lose the moment the emotional momentum of the debt snowball by moving mm-hmm. it yeah the debt snowball that- is where it do you know where that is do you know what the debt snowball is i've heard, I- of, it. I've heard of it i'll teach you the next segment okay. don't worry okay stay you can here bring me up to date on how to use it i will i'll teach you that's so you're so kind this is the ramsey show
Rachel Cruz, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today in the lobby of Ramsey Solutions on the debt-free stage. <laughs> Jacob and Dre, is it Dre? Drea. Drea. Thank I'm you. sorry. Drea is, are with us. Where do you guys live? Nashville. Nash, yeah. Nashville. Nashville. <laughs> All right. Now, I understand from Kelly that you guys have a unique approach to getting out of debt, a unique situation. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> tell, tell us tell us what your story before we ask about the debt. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, essentially, at the time, we were just a couple, boyfriend and girlfriend, and I had asked him, very early on, we were really vulnerable and open about where we stood financially, um, you know, what our fin- financial status was, and... So it made the conversation really easy when I asked him, like, you know, for, like, our future, like, should we get married, things like that. Like, what what do you want to see from that? And um, I had asked him if he had heard of you. <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I, I was familiar. I knew <laughs> name, yeah. baby steps, but that was about it. Never right. practiced any of it. Yeah, okay. and I had actually started the journey back in 2019 um, because my friends Dan and Michelle had actually introduced me to you as well as the baby steps and mm-hmm. subsequently gifted me financial peace university oh wow yeah and so you were all in i was so all in. <laughs> okay um, so how much debt did you start with well at that time because i ended up relapsing oh um, okay <laughs> I, I ended up relapsing um so at that point i think it was like eighteen thousand. i can't quite remember okay. but at that point it was that i relapsed um <laughs> and so once we got together and started talking more about it i you know asked wait a minute him, wait, wait, wait. You, you drove right by you flunked financial peace university well i passed oh, that i passed no. that <laughs> and, <laughs> but it, it's, a, it's a class you can't flunk. You just get to do it again. Okay, well, so how much were you, how much debt were you in? At that point, I was in 18000 got up to the point where I all I had left was my student loan. Now, however, that was right when COVID hit and when the forbearance okay, so went so when in. you all are having this discussion, you had... 18,000. Not at that point. This was oh. before we got together. Oh, okay. She's here yeah. from the beginning. Uh-huh. From the beginning. So, so, so <laughs> I'm telling you, we're all over the Thank place. Thank you. Okay. I'm just, I'll catch up in a minute. You got to help me, Drea. Okay. Now, so the, at the point you're having this discussion and we're getting real, you said you had how much debt? Well, at the point that we got together, I had $24,000 in debt. That's what I'm after. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So you start this portion of the journey with 24. Right. The portion of the journey where you all are dating and it's going to lead mm-hmm. towards marriage. Correct. Correct. Okay. Yes. And uh, what about you, Jacob? At this point in the relationship <laughs> where you're leading, how much debt did you have? 18000 Okay. All right. And so now we have the discussion and we start these individual tracks. Right. Mm-hmm. You're so, like, I got to know what these baby steps are because this girl's bugging me about it. <laughs> yeah. Kind of. Kind of. I, yeah. It was a very but, fluid conversation. He was really open to the idea because, again, I'd kind of... <laughs> Dave. <laughs> I've kind of gone through it before. <laughs> um, so, you know, I was already familiar and already knew what that entailed. And so when I was telling him about it, he was all on board. It made sense. It I made was just sense. like, oh, this, yeah, this is a way to get out of this. Let's do it. Right. Okay. And so yeah. I started asking him like, you know, would you want to just do this like a lo- accountability base? Would you want to do this alongside me? Because one of the things that we knew from the get go was that we did not want to introduce the number one cause of divorce into our marriage when that time came. Mm. And so we, we had to make sure we we were on the same page with that. Right. right. And right. so we, and we were, we were. Very <laughs> wise. Never, yeah. Very wise. There was never any kind of like hiccup or any kind of, you know, headbutting with that. So I'm the nerd of the, <laughs> of the relationship. And Free so, spirit. <laughs> and so I started to kind of buckle down with like, okay, like if you, you know, if you kept with your journey and I kept with mine, here's where we could be. Mm-hmm. And at that point we would have been debt free by our anniversary, which is in June next month. So we're like, okay, six months. Like you're, dating anniversary yes right okay yeah. so um, all right. yeah okay. so we were like okay like that would be cool like what a way to celebrate mm-hmm. um but i'm psychotic and so i was like well wait a minute um I, I was like you know we we have friends wedding that was coming up in march at that point and i was like what if we did it by the wedding and at that point it was going to be 100 days so we were cutting it in half yeah. <laughs> His eyes, he gave that look. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was like, this, we just cut this in half. And uh, yeah. and so he was a little bit weary about it. And so I, again, kind of rewrote it down. I was like, look, if we pick up a couple of side hustles and we really get at it, we can do this. Like, I, I really feel confident that we can do this. And so once- Because I want to get married. I, I, I'm ready I for did. it. I did, No, I mean, of course, because I mean, who wouldn't? <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, but it was more of just like, we can get out of this. Because yeah. again, I had dragged it out. 
I had relapsed. He's been through his own situation, which, you know, he may share. And so once I presented him with the plan of like, look, we can get this done in 100 days. It was game on. Yeah, so, we just worked the plan. So you did the whole thing in 100 days. <laughs> we did the whole thing in uh, 71, 71 days. days. Oh, oh my gosh. My gosh. Yeah. Y'all are psychotic. I love you. <laughs> Leg- legitimately. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so You're what amazing. Did that, what, did that, what are those yeah. 71 days? What did that look like? like sleepless? What, yeah, what, yeah, Le- yeah. Legitimately. Like, about legitimately sleepless. We, so what side I, hustles did you do? Because get? we both did essentially the same things to get there, yeah. which is why we were able to start and end at the exact same, same time. time. Um, so essentially what the days kind of looked like, we would get up around 2.30 or so in the morning and go side hustle until 8 a.m. when our full-time job, job started. started. We'd do our full-time jobs from 8 until 5, and then we would side hustle again until about 11 p.m. at night. Yeah. And then just repeat. Wash, rinse, repeat for 71 days. What was the uh, yeah. the best paying side hustle you did? Oh, well, at that, well, um, Amazon, Amazon, Flex. delivering, Amazon delivering for okay. Amazon. Yeah. We yeah. may have delivered to your house. Who knows? Who knows? Okay. <laughs> you probably did. <laughs> uh, it's a higher probability you delivered to Rachel's house. I was house. like, uh, yeah, yeah. We, uh, I get a package almost every day. Push the button, Rachel. Push the button. <laughs> I know. I love Amazon. <laughs> so yeah, that was that was probably the the yeah. most, yeah. especially because we did it during the holidays. We started. Way to dis- go, you guys. Thank okay, you. so now you're officially married or engaged? We're engaged. engaged. We're getting married on our anniversary next month. <laughs> oh! Yeah. Okay, well, that'll help so everybody great. know what the anniversary is yeah. going forward. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. Super simple. Can't screw it up if it's one day. This is awesome. Way to go, you guys. Thank you. That's amazing. Man, I'm so oh, proud of you. Thank you so, you, so much. You, you were smart and that wise and that you weren't married. You did not combine your finances. Right. Right. Did. You just encouraged each other, but you were so in sync. It was almost it, as if combined because you were game on. Which was kind of awesome because, again, yeah. we never... Almost a competition a little bit. It li- literally was because it was of. one morning... <laughs> <laughs> I, I decided I was going to sleep in a little bit that day. I was going to sleep in until 4.30 instead of getting up at 3. You slacker. I know. And that's essentially what you happened. slacker. She goes, I'm going out to deliver. It calls me. She goes, I'm going out to deliver. I go, all right, I guess I am too. Here we go. Calling out your manhood, man. Exactly. <laughs> You're sleeping in, you slacker. Yeah. You know, but... It- but it's been such a cool thing, too, because, you know, now we're each on baby step three. And what we've realized and learned is that we will have our completed emergency fund by the time we're married. Yeah. So yeah. we're yeah. just starting our marriage off on, like, the best foot financially. You guys are fun. And thank you. Y'all are going to have a blast. You're going to be uh, so wealthy, and you're going to have so much fun doing it. Yeah. Oh, we know. Yeah. We're, I mean, we... we <laughs> <laughs> listening to your show helps us realize where we're going to be because yeah. listening to other people's debt-free screams and, and just the success Seriously. that they've had has really yeah. helped us kind of visualize it and go after it. Yeah. Okay, so, so let me ask this real quick. Sure. I don't want to veer off from the from the okay. debt-free, but real quick, how was planning a wedding with cash? Because we get easy. that call a lot. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. Uh, we're we're cash flowing the entire thing, and we actually run it out because we're having a very intimate wedding uh-huh. um, out in wine country, California, because that's where I'm yeah. from. <laughs> I'm from California, so, um, and so that's just kind of my dream. And we rented out the whole inn and paid for, because we're having everyone stay with us, and so we paid for half of their rooms, so that wow. way they don't have to worry about it. So we're cash flowing everything, everything. on top of our emergency. <laughs> It makes it easy. That's amazing, y'all. That's destination great. Destination wedding. Because yeah. people say, I can't pay for a wedding if I don't have it, but you guys are ca- no, literally cash flowing. Yeah, yeah. So, and you know, we talk about a lot, we talk about it a lot, how much our mindset has just shifted mm. since starting mm-hmm. this, you know, mm-hmm. and, and accomplishing this, like, together. But, so, you know, because yeah. there is a sense of togetherness when we have the same shared Y'all are goal. fun. Yeah. This is great. Thank you. We, try, <laughs> we got a copy of a Baby Steps Millionaires for you. It's uh, us. Because that's the next be chapter us. in your story. <laughs> yeah. We also got a gift card for you to Ramsey Plus, which oh, is Financial Peace awesome. University, every dollar for a year yes. that's going to be a great wedding gift or you can give it away to a friend if bridesmaid if you so want much. yeah that kind of thing very cool stuff and a copy of total money makeover i know you're going to give that away and that's why we give it to you so you can I've pay got it my forward. copies and yeah. he started so, so we're on it yeah. you guys you guys are wonderful so fun thank you thank you for thank sharing you. your story Thanks. you give inspiration to all the singles out there that are trying to figure out how to navigate this whole process jacob andrea in nashville did it as two singles now getting married wonderful 24 and 18 thousand paid off in 70 one days all they did was work count it down let's hear a debt free scream three, three two, two one, one. I'm, I'm debt, debt free, free. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they are fabulous aren't they so fun? fun they just had a handshake you missed it <laughs> they did that that <laughs> they're funny it's great this is the ramsey show Five, four, three.
Rachel Cruz, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Carlos is in Houston. Hey, Carlos, welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi, how you doing? Better than we deserve, sir. How can we help? Um, all right, well, I have a couple questions, but I just kind of want to keep it short. Um, I've been watching your shows, and I actually started reading your books um, not too long ago. So I've been kind of... Uh, diving into watching all your shows pretty consistently lately, um, even through lunches like right now. But um, I have a little bit of debt, well, a lot of debt that I have to try to take care of. And uh, it all kind of started, uh, long story short, about three years ago during uh, COVID, right before COVID, mm. I purchased my house. I got a new car. And um, we had gotten kind of I know it sounds kind of dumb, but based off all your videos, you know, we kind of fell into a timeshare um, where it didn't really seem like it was until a month later when we tried to get out and it was impossible since then. So I've kind of been stuck in that for, you know, coming up to two, three years now. We went through so much trouble. Um, I mean, with a lot of details left out, we went through lots of headaches and stress trying to get out of it. And, um, I actually got out of the job that I was currently in that was kind of uh, getting damaged by COVID. So now I'm at a job where I'm consistent. But I just really want your advice on how to get out of this debt, where to kind of get started. I kind of have an idea, but um, I did refinance that timeshare into a personal loan um, almost immediately after we did it to save on interest and save on payments. I just didn't want to be paying too much. But now I'm still stuck with that debt that after years of contacting them and calling and, and just getting misled doesn't seem like I'm going to get out of it. So I'm really wanting to see um, how I can get rid of all this debt and what's the best scenario um, as best as, as So I how can. much debt do you have, Carlos? All right. So not counting the mortgage, um, I have about 72000 in vehicles between me and my wife, um, 20000 in loan and uh, ten thousand in credit card. Okay. And what do you? What's your household income? Uh, Seventy-five thousand. Okay. You got to sell some cars. Fine. Yeah. Like all of them. That, uh, yes, sir. <laughs> and that's kind of ironic. It, it, just listening to your show today, even it kind of pinpointed different questions throughout the call-ins. And now coming to my situation, that's kind of what I've been thinking about a lot. Like I've kind of figured if I call Mr. Ramsey, you know, he's gonna he's gonna tell me that's the first thing he's gonna tell me. So it's just something that I kind of wanted some help yeah. on. Yeah. So here here's the thing: seventy five percent of your debt is car debt. We can get rid of three quarters of your problem selling two used cars that you can't afford problem is you love them and they're beautiful wonderful cars yes sir yeah what are they yes sir and uh what kind of cars are a, they a forerunner it's a forerunner and a tacoma mm. Mm, you can get car. great money from that though and carlos they the great keep news their value, is, the great news they really is they're do. probably going to sell for more than you owe that's actually kind of what I was going to bring up is I went to a dealer not too long ago seeing the stress of everything that happened throughout the years and they actually offered for my truck uh, 46000 and it's been kind of haunting me in my head even though as much as I feel like I can't find this truck again, I kind of wanted to can, rely on your advice. And I figured I could just get rid of it. I mean, I even thought, you know, just to simply sell that truck for what they want and get something that's $20,000 less. I could probably put all that into the personal loan, pay that off, and use it. What do you owe on that back, car? Uh, uh, Forty thousand. Okay. Well, you you can't get something twenty thousand dollars less. You got to get something forty thousand dollars less. We're getting yeah. out of debt, not into debt. So you would be your advice would be to remove both of them, not just one. Yeah. You kind of wanted to yeah. keep one of them. Yeah, I'd get rid of all of them. Listen, you don't need to, if you own things with wheels and motors that equal more than half your annual income, you got too much invested in things that are going down in value. The only time cars have gone up in value in the history of the freaking world is in the last five months. Prior to that, they've gone down in value every year and they will again, as soon as the supply catches up with the demand and the new cars are starting to hit the lots again. Uh, so it's just a matter of time. This is the best time in the world to get out of a dead gum used car mess. And son, you got to use car mess. You got to get out of these things.
And so Carlos, too, you know, it's it's buying a crappy five thousand dollar car somewhere. Yep, yep. And you both drive that, but for a short period of time, Carlos. That's what when you said, "Oh, but I don't know if I can get this kind of truck again." You can. I promise. Tacomas will be made. It you may it may take you three four years to get it, but you can get another car, another great car that you love again. But right now, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. The stress and the pain that these have caused you guys already. It's not worth it. So getting rid of that. And so then I, let me, I, I think it's fun to illustrate this. So you're right. He will get something again. So Carlos, when I went through this myself, it was a long time ago, but uh, I was down to one car and a friend loaned me a 1978 Cadillac with 478,000 actual miles on it. And the predominant color on the thing was Bondo. It was a piece of crap. It was a car that was embarrassing anywhere in town, even in the worst neighborhoods in town. They laughed at you in every stoplight driving this car. I drove that car for three months, and I saved up $1,000 and got a considerably better car. This morning, I drove in a classic 1960 Corvette that I bought that is one of several automobiles that I own. If you will drive like no one else, later you can drive anything you want to drive, sir. So I, I'm not bragging. I'm just saying that what I've been doing this a long time. And I, I, when I was driving that piece of crap car, I thought the world was coming to an end. And I kind of thought about that car this morning with the top down on that Corvette driving to work. I thought, you know, if you live like no one else later, you can live and drive like no one else. This stuff we teach works. Over the time. That's it. And that came from after being in a nice car yeah. that you were in. Now, I was driving a Jaguar. I, I was just thinking, I don't know why... I don't know why your your daughter's heart just kind of giggles that a Jaguar was like the thing. It wasn't a Mercedes, but a Jaguar. I don't know why. Mercedes, a lot of people had. Nobody had a Jaguar. Oh, is that what it was? Jaguars it was the unique. Were, Jaguars were exotic. Oh, okay, okay. So the Jaguar, nineteen eighty what? Just saying it. What? Oh, okay. A redneck says Jaguar. I mean, it's like a thing, you know. What, so, what so year, these, are, wait, these are words that don't ro that? roll off of a <laughs> off of a redneck's lips very what often. What year was it? It was the first one was a um, yeah an eighty. Okay, so nineteen eighty. You are you're not Carlos Carlos. I'm not I'm not pinning you like aim to go from what you want. I sold that to keep it from to being go repo. into Bondo car. Yeah, I was going broke. Was painful. And I sold it. So Carlos, here yeah, I went, still I went from a super nice car. Yep. A nicer car in those days than you've got today. Yes. Into a piece of absolute trash. So. That wasn't even mine. It was loaned to me. Yes. So, Carlos, prepare for the pain driving the crappy car for a little bit. But it's worth it for a short period of time to yeah. get on the other side to get what you want I later. did that for three months. That's right. But we're telling the story right now, <laughs> my, my stomach kind of hurts still. It was painful. So funny. It was awful. It felt, I, I always say I, I did that for 10 years, one three-month period. Because that's how it felt like. It felt like it was forever. Because, I mean, when everybody laughs at you at every stoplight, there's a lot of shame involved. I, know, you know? I just wonder who laughs at people in cars. Like, I feel like you haven't seen this car. Person. This car, this you would laugh at this car if you saw it at a stoplight. Oh. I mean, it's just, yeah. I mean, and you're a sweet person. But it's like, you look at that and you go, this poor guy. Yeah. I mean, he must be homeless. It looks awful. How does he drive that car? It's horrible. And the uh, Bondo or the uh, vinyl roof was torn loose across the top. So when you filled, drove it, it filled up with air. So it looked like now a that parachute. That was the kind of car we grew up in, though. It looked with you like guys. a parachute. What was the brown car y'all had when we were kids? That was a Mark 7. Oh, that was later on. Man, I remember driving into the like drop, school's drop off line. And that thing, the it would bubble up and you had to like push it up. No, that was the headliner did, not the top top. Oh. This is on top would fill up with air. Like you had a parachute on top of your car. Oh, no. It was so bad. No, th that was the headliner the in headliner that old brown would, one. Yes. I'd forgotten that. And it would like rest on our heads and we'd be like, mm. Yeah, for about a week and then I fixed it. But yeah, I forgot about that. That did happen. I remember that. That's the car I delivered books out of the trunk. The, the first brown, financial piece the book. The brown car. I had the little hump on the trunk. It was a, a 1985 Mark 7. Is what that so was. So Carlos, at. look, your future is bright. Your car yeah. future is bright, Carlos. You can do this. You can do this. All this to say <laughs> that cars are temporary. Cars are temporary. They're not forever. This is The Ramsey Show. Hey, it's Rachel Cruz, co-host on The Ramsey Show. If you want to do your debt-free scream live on the show, visit RamseySolutions.com slash debt-free scream. We'd love for you to come to Nashville and tell Dave your story. That's RamseySolutions.com slash debt-free scream.
This is The Ramsey Show. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, it's The Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. This is The Ramsey Show, where we help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create amazing actual relationships. Rachel Cruz, Ramsey personality, number one best-selling author, and my daughter is my co-host today as we answer your questions about your life and your money. Troy is with us at 888-825-5225. He's in Sacramento. Hi, Troy. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. And thanks, Dave. And thanks, Rachel, for taking my call this afternoon. Sure. How can we help? You know, uh, my wife and I have been big fans, and we've followed uh, a lot of your teachings and precepts over the years, and it's allowed us to uh, come to a place of having no debt other than a little bit left over on a uh, on a on a primary mortgage. We'd like to move out of Sacramento. And I'm, my question directly is, if we paid off our home, that would be, we'd be debt free and it'd be great. And then we would be freed up to invest more and more into either retirements or other um, investment opportunities. My question is, do you ever consider a larger mortgage, like buying a more expensive home or in a more expensive area as your primary residence as an investment vehicle rather than using the money in investing in, say, the stock market? Well, the problem with that is that um, you're violating the rule of diversification because then you've got so much tied up in one asset. So let me give you an example. As we're studying the uh, 10,000 millionaires in the Ramsey study of millionaires, when we would run across one, and they were very rare, but occasionally we would run across one that was a millionaire, uh, maybe their net worth is a million two, but their paid for home is a million one. Well, they're legitimately right. a millionaire. I mean, their net worth is over a million dollars, but that's a little scary because they're not diversified and that asset does not create an income for them at retirement. Right. It, it creates a place for them to live. And so they could live in a $600,000 paid for house and have $600,000 with a million two, in other words, invested creating income. And so the, while the home is an asset, it is not an income producing asset. Right. So, you know, in our situation, our retirement 401k is just shy of a million dollars. You know, the, our daughter's colleges, um, you know, we've saved and we have that essentially taken care of with scholarship that they've received. You know, we've got the emergency fund put in place. We've got cash in the bank. The current home value that we have is about five seventy-five, and we owe about one hundred and seventy thousand on it. And uh, and so we, you know, we feel like we've got a good base. We could continue do. doing that, pay off the house, and so you what know, price range home would you be in with your investment concept that you're pitching? Well, it's just it's right around a million dollars. And so, you know, a 30-year-old. Right, so you're mortgage, currently I, at 1617 net worth, right? Um, right in there. And right. you'd have a million of it in your home. Uh, if we went down that road, yeah. 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 And yeah, that's so a little that's high. Heavy. That's a little high. That makes me a little nervous. It's not, it's, okay. not, it's not over in the stupid column. It's just the nervous approaching stupid column. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. Well, it's not even. Sure you're saying that because my wife is listening on the other. It's line, not even so. close to stupid. Okay, <laughs> I'm joking around with you. You guys are brilliant. You're millionaires. Way to go! Congratulations. I'm so proud of you. You've done a lot of well, things right. You. So all we're doing is just discussing the fact that um, you're going to have uh, what sixty uh, percent of your net worth tied up in non-income producing assets. I'll give you another example. Right. I'll give you another example of that. Okay, I've got a 250 acre farm that is that does absolutely nothing except hold the earth together, and is a place for me to shoot guns and drive four wheelers. It does not create any income. It's worth millions of dollars. Okay, but it does not create any income. If that was the larger portion of my total net worth, that would be unwise because it really is a receptacle for bullets and and four-wheelers. That's really all it does. It doesn't create anything right. for me to live off of. And so even though it's a wonderful investment, because it's, it's, it's in a prime location, it's, it's in one of the fastest-growing counties in the nation, you know, it's, it's wonderful ground. 
But, as you know, someday when some Ramsey sells it, it won't be while I'm alive, but while some Ramsey sells it, they will do very well on it. But it's not an income producer. So that's the whole that's the whole discussion. And you guys just got to balance that out in your minds and go, OK, and what is our income and how can, much can we add to the 700,000 of income producing assets if we do this so that it's less and less and less and less out of balance? It starts to bother me. What when, percentage? Because like you said 60 there, but what's the... Yeah, I mean, it, when you get north of 50, it starts to be scary. I mean, yeah. you got a million, two, and a half of it's in a house. That's not too bad mm-hmm. as long as you're adding to your investments, right? Yeah. Um, but I, I'm, I'm, but again, it would change. It skews. The percentages would skew as you go way up, too. So I say you had a $20 million net worth. Well, I wouldn't want you to be anywhere near that in your personal residence. Sure. Yes. You know, maybe maybe uh, one twentieth, five percent would be a million dollar house. Yeah. Or a two million dollar house would be ten percent with a twenty million dollar net worth. But you shouldn't be dr- sitting around in a ten million dollar house with a twenty more. That would be yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. You know, it, you can do it, but I just don't think it'd be wise. Yes. It, and so, so uh, yeah. in my mind, it would be ridiculous. And and, and you're and I'm just gonna go a step further because what you're saying though it's. M- mostly majority because there's not an income producing element to it. It's not that like the house is going to be taken. Like it's not like it's a risky thing yeah. because it's there. If he dies, what's his wife going to eat on? Yeah. She can't yeah. eat the bushes in front of the house. Right. No matter how valuable they are. She got to sell the house in order to liquidate, to get money. Mm-hmm. And I don't want her to have to do that. I want her to be able to live comfortably on the income producing portion of the, of the portfolio. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. That, that's, what, that's what's running through my head. It, it's, they're okay as long as they're sitting there right now. If everything stays the same, he keeps creating. We don't even ask what his income is, but I'm sure it's great. Mm-hmm. I mean, and he's a smart guy. They're going to do fine. They're, they're smart people. They're, they're, there's really not a horrible answer in this whole thing. But the the... And so, you know, let's say, let's pretend they make 300000 and they're going to have no house payment and they're going to be in a million. So that house is pretty well, it's going to go up in value. It's California real estate, but uh, but it, it's not what they're dependent on. In other words, they're going to take a 150 of that two of that 300, start throwing it, adding to that 700. In 10 years, this thing will really not be out of whack at all. Yeah. As long as he doesn't die, as long as they, he doesn't quit it working, as long as that income doesn't go away and we don't complete the plan. But if you stop early in the plan, you might have to liquidate the house. That's what that's kind of I, I kind I want things to work when they don't work and when they do work. Yeah. I want yeah. the plan to have addressed both sides of the equation. And that's that's all I'm wincing about mm-hmm. when we're talking about this. But, yeah. And, and so, yeah, it, the overall idea, too, is diversification. Spread your portions to seven. Yes, to eight for disaster may come upon the land. That's a biblical reference from Ecclesiastes. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Some dude will cause a pandemic to happen or go crazy when a pandemic does happen or something. And then you'll be there where there you'll be in that mess again. This is the Ramsey Show. If I gave you three thousand dollars right now, what would you do with it? Play craps in Vegas. No, I'm just kidding. I'm totally kidding. Or am I? No. What would I do? Three thousand dollars right now? Seriously? Yeah. Um. Oh my gosh. I would probably go buy something. Yeah. I'd give some away. Yeah. I would save some, and then, <laughs> and then I would go spend. You're it. You're trying to give the right answer. Is that what you're doing? <laughs> All right. So, Why? well, are you, it's are one you of the, giving hey, me three thousand or no? It's one of the best times of the year at, at Ramsey. We're not giving you three thousand, but we're giving <laughs> one of our listeners oh, three thousand dollars. Oh, that's pretty fun. And five hundred dollars a week in May, and a grand prize of three thousand dollars in the Ramsey Cash Giveaway. To enter the Ramsey Cash Giveaway, go to RamseySolutions.com/slash 
giveaway. Don't forget, you can enter every day for extra chances to win. There is absolutely no purchase necessary, but you must be 18 or older to win. And we're not stopping there to help you crush your financial, personal, and professional goals. We're putting our number one best-selling books and tools in the Ramsey $10 sale. In many cases, that's 60 to 70 to even 80% off. 10 bucks doesn't get you much anymore, but during the $10 sale, you can get stuff like the Total Money Makeover or Rachel's book, Know Yourself, Know Your Money, which can save you thousands of dollars in debt problems and everything else help put you on the road to becoming a millionaire. It's a great return for 10 bucks. Check out the Ramsey $10 sale. Don't forget to enter the Ramsey Cash Giveaway at RamseySolutions.com. Com. Ryan is in Orlando. Hey, Ryan, welcome to the Ramsey Show. Super Dave, how you doing, sir? Better than I deserve. What's up? Hey, I just, you know, first of all, I just appreciate you and Rachel taking my phone call. And uh, I, I got, got to give a big uh, shout out to Sharon. You know, she she must be an amazing mom and a, a wonderful wife. Sharon, so make, make sure that's so you nice. Tell her that. She, we'll when pass that home. along, Ryan, and you were right. She is. How can awesome. we help today? All right. So, um, you know, I've been listening to the show the last couple of years and, you know, I, I've noticed, you, you know, you yourself had to kind of bob and weave a little bit through the changes and, you know, you stayed the course and, and, and things are going well and, you know, you're an inspiration. So to get to the point, you know, 2019 was a tough year. Uh, I've been married the last couple of years prior to that. 2019, my, my wife left uh, in uh-huh. November uh-huh. after we paid off, you know, all her debt and, uh-huh. and things of that nature. Not a big deal. March of 2020, I uh, got the divorce paperwork, pandemic hit, the whole nine yards. Wow. So need to, needless to say, I, I pushed pause on the baby steps, um, just kind of focused on me, mental health and things of that nature. Uh-huh. Um, Wise. And increased my my uh, my revenue, done really well. Um, but now I'm at the point, you know, it, the divorce was finalized last year uh, in June, and uh, you know we're almost at that year mark. So I'm I'm ready to push play and kind of get things rolling. So where I'm at right now, I got 128 grand in the bank. I have a rental house. I owe 84 grand. And it's got one of those stupid second mortgages on it for forty-two grand. So that's one hundred and twenty-six. I could literally get that paid off. But at the end of May, my parents are gifting me or blessing me with a car, which I'm giving them ten grand for. So I'm, I'm about eight grand short. The rental house the people are leaving in August. So I guess I'm at that point now. Do I could have all the money by July? Should I wait to get everything paid off until I get renters back in the house? Or should I go ahead and just push play and and keep that baby step emergency fund because the house will be paid off, but I'll just be waiting to get a renter in there. You have an emergency fund in addition to the money you have, the 128 in the bank. Just keeping the baby step, the the, the $1,000. Oh, okay. No, okay. You don't have any debt but the rental. Uh, yeah, I own a, 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 my regular house, but it's on wheels, so I didn't want to bring that up. <laughs> okay, all right. But the uh, uh, all right, but you don't have any debt other than real estate debt. That's it. Okay, all of the real estate debt falls into baby step six. Well, so I own a house that I live in. Mm-hmm. This is considered a rental house, mm-hmm. which is baby step six. Okay. So you, that's you even have, a rental you, house. You know, but you are going to go ahead. How much do you owe on the the house you live in? It's fifty eight. Okay, I won't pay it off before I pay off the rental. So you have one hundred twenty eight thousand. You have one hundred twenty eight thousand in the bank, and uh, you need ten grand to buy a car, and you need to have a fully funded emergency fund of three to six months of expenses. And so, Correct. what, what, no, would, I, what I, would your what would your normal fully funded emergency fund be? How much would that be? I would probably like to keep it at fifteen twenty, but okay, it really just, six months is probably seven eight grand. Well, mm-hmm. all right, let, let, let's let's call it uh, 
let's call it 20 for the fun of it for a minute. That leaves mm-hmm. you 108, and you need 10 for the ha- for the thing. That leaves you 98, and then you pay off the one you live in. That leaves you 40, and so you could pay off the second mortgage. And the only mortgage you'd have left is your first mortgage on the rental, if I did the math right. Mm-hmm. You'd have the car, an emergency fund, your residence would be paid off, and the second mortgage on the rental would be paid off, and you'd still have a little bit to throw at the first mortgage, but not much. Yeah. And then just use your budget money to begin to ta- get that first mortgage paid off. And uh, what did you say you make a year? I'm I'm north of 100 right now. I made 108 last year. I'm on target there now. Were the, okay. ki- were the kids in the marriage? No, thank God. No, no, no kids. Okay. All right. And so we made one twelve together and she left. I got it up to one oh eight by myself. So okay. God is good. Yeah, yeah. So But uh, I, I knew you were gonna say that. Okay. Um All right. I, I just think for me it's so much benefit to get it paid off the rental house. You might sell it. The house is on the house is on wheels. I I might sell that and move too. Well, you might sell it too, but at least it's paid for for now. Yeah. You get money out of either one of them when you sell them. We're no, not no. we're not spending no. the money. It's just a matter of where we're going to park it for the most peace. When the place you sleep in right. is paid for, it changes the way your head hits the pillow. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I just I wanted to kick in the rump, I guess. But I don't. I don't. I don't think you need. I a, I, I, I don't think you need a kick in the rump. I think you've had enough of those. I think you need. You're a, doing yeah, great, Ryan. You. You're doing I, great. I, I actually think you need a hug. Yeah. You sound like you're hurting, I'm, man. I'm back involved in church, and Good. I love my church, and there's some great people there. So yeah. I'm surrounded by it. You still got that. you. You still got some sadness hanging on you. Yeah, I do. It's tough. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what yeah. you've been through. It's been a hard, you're hard good. season for you. You, uh, you, yeah. you're, you're a good man. You got a big heart, and your heart was broken. And it takes courage, Ryan, to press play again. I mean, when you paused it, you know, which I think was wise with what you were walking through. To kind of tackle this again, it take, I mean, it takes a level of like, okay, I'm going to re-engage, and that can be really difficult. So um, I'm excited for you. I think you have great traction. You obviously have an incredible work ethic. You're you're being wise and thinking through all the steps and what to do. Um, but I think you're I think you're going to do great. I'm going to send you a copy of Dr. John's number one bestseller that just hit the number one spot. Um, own, own your past, change your future. I think when you read through that, um, it's going to help your heart. And um, a lot of us have been through having our hearts broken in different ways in the last 36 months, 24 months, um, and uh, some much more tragic things than others, uh, certainly. Uh, but most people have experienced a, uh, an increase in pain uh, during this time of one kind or another, and it's not unusual at all for us to have some lingering sadness from that, some grief from all of that. And uh, you just look back and you go, what in the world was I thinking? Well, you know, you were sad. So the interesting thing is when you start taking these actions with that money instead of sitting on that money like mm-hmm. it's an egg, it's gonna you're going to get some energy from taking the actions. Mm-hmm. You know, writing a check to mom and dad, get the car. Write a check, pay off the house with wheels. Pay off the second mortgage. Set that emergency fund aside in a physical, separate, brand new account that's just for emergencies never to be touched or mixed with any other accounts. When you start making some of these moves again, the literal movement will give you some energy back. But hang on, Kelly, I'll pick up. We're going to send you a copy of his book. And um, just want you to know Rachel and I are hugging you right now, brother. This is The Ramsey Show. Rachel Cruz, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today in the lobby of Ramsey Solutions on the debt-free stage. Robert and Crystal are with us. Hey, guys, how are you? Doing well. How are you? Better than we deserve. (laughs) Welcome. Where do you guys live? 
just north of Baltimore. Cool. Welcome to Nashville. Thank you. And all the way here to do a debt-free scream. How much have you paid off? A little over 75000 in about 25 months. Good for nice. you. And your range of income during that time? It was about 87 to 130 Cool. Very good. Good for you. Well done. Okay, what kind of debt was the 75000 uh, It was about fifty six in student loans. Um, Sorry. <laughs> we had 12 in a car, uh, five credit cards, and a small family loan. Ah, okay. Cool. Well, what made you guys go on this journey almost two years ago? Well, we moved to Baltimore in 2013, and that's when I started listening to your show. Um, it was after that. I started paying off my student loan debt by myself because mm-hmm. uh, we weren't married yet until 2015. Mm-hmm. Uh, but even after 2015, we didn't combine. So I was still kind of paying my own off. And uh, finally, in July 2019, I, I fin- finally paid it off. Um, and that was when she was like, oh, you know, maybe it's possible. Mm-hmm. So we, were, we took a trip up to uh, my parents for, I think it was Thanksgiving that year, end of 2019. And... Uh, I was like, let's listen to something on the radio because Haley was in the back seat with a, a movie, and I was like, put, you know, put the Ramsey show on. She was like, uh. and she's like, all right, let's put it on. So we listened to it. She's like, listen to the people, and she's like, oh, we can do this. So we went on the trip. <laughs> we came, we came back, and uh, we combined finally, wow. and wow. Uh, we started, you know, going on the journey right at the beginning of 2020. Oh, uh, of course. And then. Um, you know, we we pay off a few things, the credit cards first, and she's like, "Wow, that's not that difficult." Yeah, and then I'm, um, basically with the credit cards, just to throw that out there, I had two credit cards. I was paying seventy on one, measly seventy dollars, and the other one was paying, you know, a hundred dollars. So when I paid seventy dollars and then a little bit extra, it got quickly paid off. And I go, "Wait, the seventy dollars I can do? I can buy more clothes, makeup." Or I could put it towards the other credit card. And when I put that combined of the 100 and the $70, mm. it didn't seem like I was taking extra money in my pocket. And then all of a sudden, in three months, that credit card was paid off. And so that's where I had this epiphany, like, wow, this actually really works. And it's not putting a strain on our family. It's not putting a strain on me. It's just actually... It's just extra money that I was actually pouring towards a credit card that I didn't even need to have. Mm. So I started to see the snowball effect, and it really got me pumped. That's awesome. Yeah, and then and then we had another issue. Um, early April, our cat got sick. We had to put some money into him. But then April 6th, he, uh, we put him to sleep. Aww. Morning of April 7th, I get a phone call from her, and I'm at work. And I've said, you know, she's probably still upset. And then... Um, <laughs> She go. I answer the phone and she says, uh, I just got let go from my job. Due to COVID. Yeah. So 2020 was really uh, hard for us. And I honestly, it was a blessing. Um, thank you, God, because of the fact that we paid those credit cards off. So if we didn't pay that little extra bit before going into 2020, we would have been in a very dire situation. Like, mm-hmm. how do we pay for mm. our house? Daycare. Um, but I, honestly, it was a dis- like a blessing in disguise. Mm. Yeah. So... Um, a couple months, you know, she got a severance that helped cover things. A couple months went by, she got another job, ended up being, it was a work from home, but it was a fairly toxic work environment. Yeah. Um, her boss was kind of bullying her a little bit. And so she ended up quitting that after a few months, um, two, three months go by, she finally gets another job as a, a recruiter, uh, but a job that she had interviewed for previously got in contact with her after she took that job and it's the one that she wanted. Wow. She ended up leaving that to take the one she has now. Yeah. So, and, you know, it was about a 75% pay raise where Whoa. she was at the beginning of the year <laughs> yeah. to where she ended the year. So. Yeah, and on top of that, um, we pushed our daughter into kindergarten. She was right on the cusp to start first or kindergarten. And so when we got her in there, we didn't have to pay for daycare, which was another mortgage mm-hmm. payment. So that really, that severance pay um, and the extra money from the daycare, we were just pushing it towards any debt that we had because honestly, that was money already being taken out of our pockets. Why would we just keep it in our 
in our pockets to spend miscellaneous on miscellaneous things. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was just telling Kat, like, you know, in 2020, you would think we wouldn't be able to pay all this debt, but think about it. In 25 months, that is including 2020, yeah, and mm-hmm. it's including 2021, and we were able to pay all that. So it's amazing. Yeah. And you went through all kinds of ups and downs and dipsy doodles to get there. It wasn't easy, but no. it definitely. Uh, it got me the opportunity that I waited patiently for the dream job um, that I always prayed for and asked mm. for. <laughs> That's amazing, you guys. So through that, I mean, obviously there were some hard spots. What would you say was the thing that, that kept you going? Like that secret thing out there that people are like, wow, they did all of that in two years. Like, what's the secret? What's the thing? Well, for me, it's just getting on the same page with her. Because, mm. you know, that whole time before we were just, I was paying myself my own student loans yeah and then we combine and it's you know when you put the power of the two incomes together you can really yes make it happen i would say for me is one me praying and being grateful and content with what i have we didn't Mm -hmm. live outside of our means and second to just stick with it and see it through like i said i was paying 70 dollars on one credit card and a hundred for what Mm. And once I pay that $70 off, I had, I can literally be like, oh, let's go and spend it on eating out and so forth. But I didn't. I put it towards the $100. And $170 paid that credit card off within three months instead of like, oh, the seven or eight months that I like projected it to pay off. Mm. So right. stick with it, see it through and see that snowball effect. It actually, it, it's amazing because it just pushed me to do more. It's awesome. That's awesome. It's the well, momentum well. of getting those, it those wins. And you're like, okay, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. You don't want to stop. That, that extra money that we all paid off a of debt literally is now, it's not money out of our pockets yeah. at all. It's actually saving for our new house. Mm. And it's not like a strain on us like most people would think. It's like, no, that money was from that $70 credit card of ours, yeah. <laughs> that $100 off, that $15,000 car, you know, pay, it all collected up. Mm. And I just, I wish that like my friends would see like, yeah. this is what happened. That's always that you're at. Your largest wealth building tool is your income. And it when is. you actually get to keep your income instead of it going back out to the 70, the 100, the car, right? It's like exactly. you said, it's yours. It's like, oh, this is actually my money that I can use yep. to do what I want. So that's amazing, you guys. Congratulations. Thank you. Well done. Proud of you. Thank you. Good Thank work. You. And you brought your daughter along to scream with you. What is her name and age? You want to bring her up into the shot? Yep. This is Haley, and she is oh, six so years so old. So Hi, Haley. So sweet. Hi. She's so pretty with those teeth. Thank I you. love it. <laughs> I love it. That's perfect. Good stuff. All right. We've got a copy of Baby Steps Millionaires for you, because that's the next chapter in your story, a copy of Total Money Makeover for you to give away. And uh, this week, we started giving away also Financial Peace University and Every Dollar as a part of Ram. Plus, a one-year subscription to that. Oh, and uh, nice. you can either use all of these yourself or you can give them away as gifts or however you want to do it. We want to help you. Uh, certainly Total Money Makeover you can give away because you've already lived that part of it. And uh, on with the next chapters of life. Well done, you guys. We're proud of you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> You're amazing. Well done. Beautiful, beautiful family. Good stuff. All right. It's Robert and Crystal and Haley. $75,000 paid off in 25 months, making 87 to 130. Count it down. Let's hear a debt free scream. Three, two, two one. one. We're, We're debt free. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Way to go, you guys. Beautiful stuff. Awesome. You know, she with great enthusiasm explain the debt snowball perfectly yep you know when you pay off that little debt and you take that money and you throw it on the next one you take that money and throw it on the next one then you take that money and throw it on the next one every time you pay off another debt the snowball rolls over more money and there's more money going on but also there's more excitement yes because you get to see this benefit of this thing moving and you're actually getting traction and this whole money thing is working for the first time in your life you're working with your spouse for the first time in your life there's a lot going on there Well done, you guys. We're proud of you. This is The Ramsey Show.
This is the Ramsey Show. My co-host is Rachel Cruz, Ramsey personality, number one best-selling author. Rachel, we always have some good discussions when you're on here. You and I sometimes arguing and sometimes just <laughs> discussing something that's going on in the world. Um, and uh, always bringing, you and I bringing different perspectives to things. Yes. Well, James, the producer, emailed, what, probably two weeks ago, and was like, isn't this crazy? This played literally one year ago, this clip. So I watch it. And during, I'll say this, during some of our debates, you know, I question like, mm, Dave, he doesn't, he doesn't really, he doesn't really know. He doesn't really get it. <laughs> He's really missing the mark here on this one. He doesn't, he doesn't see it. But on this clip specifically, as I watched it again a year later, I thought, He's brilliant. <laughs> He's like, who was like the old psychic that was like the eight hundred, the one eight hundred number, uh, Miss Clea, or yeah, she, is that what it was? She got arrested, but she didn't know it was coming, so she wasn't a psychic. <laughs> I was watching. I was like, is Dave psychic? Okay, so what we're gonna play for you is the clip no, that played. No, he's just psycho. That's yeah, <laughs> maybe both. Uh, that played. It played April 27th of twenty twenty one. Okay, we got to get back. Everyone, get back in your mindset of twenty twenty one. Of early 2021, okay, the pan I mean, stuff is still here. You know, you're still wearing a mask on airplanes. COVID was still like, tri it was still kind of all kind of around the idea of it. Uh, gas just started going up. Car prices, I do not think at this point were outrageous. No. The car thing had not happened yet. Again, Biden was barely in office. Yes. Yeah, so again, we are sitting one year ago, um, basically today, when this segment aired. So we're going to play just a little bit of it, and we're going to watch... Uh, Mrs. Clea do her do her magic. <laughs> Have you after. felt this ever? I mean, for four. You know, I've never seen it like this exactly. Yeah. But uh, in nineteen in the nineteen, uh, we're, what we are going to see out of this that you've never seen, your generation has never seen, is inflation. Mm. Inflation, the components that make up the inflation index, housing is one of them. It's the biggest part of inflation, and when housing shoots up and oil shoots up. And oil has shot up, too. Yeah, it has, yeah. And, uh, you know, you, you look at the gas pump. It's oh, yeah. doubled. Oh, I know. Filled and, up my minivan no, two days no, ago. I like, nobody's, talk, nobody's talking about it. But the gas pump doubles and housing goes up a bunch. Then all of a sudden, you're going to see stuff like I saw in the 70s and 80s, which was double-digit inflation, where stuff's going up 10 15% a year. Man. And inflation was out of control. And the politicians, it took, it, you know, it took some real strong politicians to do away with it. Uh, it was out of control. How did they do away with it? Well, I, I credit Ronald Reagan. I'm just putting the brakes on because it was out of control under Carter. And he comes in and shifted economic policy and uh, just started o opening up, uh, doing away with regulation, opening up the markets. Because if you can flood the market with supply, it slows down, uh, it slows down the feeding frenzy. Because if you can get it everywhere, there's no scarcity. Sure, sure. Then the prices start to settle. You know, if there's an oversupply, prices go down. If there's an undersupply, prices go up because there's people chasing it. Sure, right? supply and demand. You know, if you, you know, half the number of people chasing it as there are, you know, you got two houses for sale for every buyer. Mm -hmm. Well, all of a sudden, prices stabilize, start to go mm -hmm. down, start to, or at least quit shooting through the roof. So the out of control upward inflation. So we're probably going to see some actual inflation out of this, which we've not seen in two decades. You watch these interest rates go up with inflation. Yeah. It'll shut this housing market down. I was going to say how, yeah, the correlation between inflation yeah. and the interest rate. If you rates go from three to six, this housing market will freeze like a deer in the headlights. It'll just stop. People just stop buying. They'll just back up and wait. And uh, that's, you're going to see some of that back and forth now. It's going to be a little rocky, mm -hmm. a little volatile. But it won't, this feeding frenzy that you've got right this second is not going to continue. We were talking about the housing market going into that. Okay, so you predicted inflation. You were like, inflation's going to happen. Your generation's never seen it before, but it will happen. And I remember thinking, oh, doomsday, Dave. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if it'll happen. Inflation has happened. And then you predicted that the interest rates for mortgages will go up, and now they're up to 5%. They've gone up in the last few months. So, like, inflation hit, mortgage price, mortgage interest is going up. What What's going to happen next? Are we heading for a recession? <laughs> Predict the recession. Predict it right now. Are we going to a recession? But seriously, isn't that all crazy, though, that you... That well, the signs were there. It's not... I, I'm not... A, no, I know, I know. I'm not The things were know, happening. Right. The components of inflation were already kicking in. We were seeing prices jump through the roof on things. And the Biden administration, on the things it could do things about, wasn't. For instance, energy. 
It, the stuff at the gas pump is his fault. The other parts of inflation, the, the Republicans are trying to blame him for, it's not his fault. It's the pandemic's fault. It was a supply and demand curve thing. And so Fox News wearing Biden out, you know, because they're trying to get GOP in at, uh, at the, um, midterms. The, the midterms, right? So it's political on, on blaming him for it. But anyway, the, um, you know, and, and we are probably going to see 6%. I said we go from three to six on mortgages, yeah. and then I said the housing market would freeze like a deer in the headlights. It will. It'll. It'll. it'll it won't. It won't go down. It's not going to be like 2008. I'm not predicting it to go down. But the, you know, two years ago in 2022, we had a 32 percent increase in the cost of housing in America. The next year, we had a 17 percent increase. The average increase over the years is about four percent. Mm. And the reason for that is very simple: shortage of on houses. New houses. Yeah. There's ten buyers. 20 buyers for every house that's on the market. And when you've got those kinds of pressures, you're going to have an artificial inflation. It's a supply-demand curve inflation. It's not a thing. It's not a prosperity-type inflation. It's not a uh, the economy's too heated up thing. But, you know, when people slow down buying houses, it will slow down the rate of increase in yeah. houses. They're yeah. not going to go down. I'm going to wait on real estate values to come down. You're going to be a, you're going to be dead before they come back down. They're not mm-hmm. coming down. They're just they're not going to go up at 32 percent a year. Yeah. Keep and rising. this idea of 400 people bidding on one house over the weekend stuff, that's going to go away. Because when you double the cost of interest, your payment on yeah, how- on a four hundred thousand dollar house goes up dramatically. Sure. Okay. So what? Yes. So those two percentage points is get from three percent to five percent. Yeah. It's gonna. It's devalued the bond market like thirty five percent. The bond market is crashing with these increases in interest okay, rates. And the market is the market has gone down. The stock market has gone down. Yes. And that's because the economy is slowing. So, that's that's recessionary. So, okay. So so the GDP the came gross, out gross domestic product, product which came is out. The, in, down Mm -hmm. over the first quarter and if it goes down two quarters in a row it's a recession so so we could be entering a recession at the end of this quarter if it continues to go down yeah we probably will and you think we'll probably hit a recession yeah i think i think we're in one yeah i think we're right square in the middle of one. i don't know how long it'll last but uh, it depends on how long they keep monkeying with stuff in washington yeah but um you know they could have done a lot to help the supply demand curve stuff like getting the ships off the ocean you know when you got billions of dollars of goods sitting in the ocean waiting to come on shore and you can't get baby formula that's a false thing caused by regulations and crap okay get the stuff out of the cartons and get it in the stores it, it's not and, and so there's some stuff that that the policy makers and the politicians can actually do that it is their fault okay so the recession word is a scary word for a lot of people because last time we hit that was yeah. during the 08 cry all of that right so you hear the word recession Recession simply means the economy is not producing as much goods and services as it used to. And it can affect you. Mainly it will affect your jobs because the businesses that are not growing do not hire. And businesses that are shrinking fire. They lay off. Uh, And it's not it's not pandemic furloughs. They say, you know, economics are bad. I have to show you know, we're we're laying you off permanently. That's what they'll do. And so there'll be some people losing jobs. So we've had this shortage of labor. We've got almost no unemployment right now. It's so bizarre. It's like the weirdest. It's the weirdest mix. It's a weird, weird, weird gumbo. And so but but uh, the stock market is slowing because profits are down because the economy is slowing even though prices are up. Yes, but people are spending, not spending as much as they were even six months ago. Right. We know that because the economy is shrinking. Because there is not stuff to buy? Uh, not stuff to buy. Uh, they are fearful? I don't Consumers know. Consumers pull back? Yeah, probably. I don't know. But recession is not an emotional thing. Mm-hmm. And it's really, honestly, it's, um, it's kind of a natural second step after a bizarre you know, supply demand inflation curve like yeah, this. Yeah. So, so will inflation go down when, once the recession yeah, or that's all yeah, yeah. it'll kind of work itself. Inflation will go down when the supplies hit the market when again. It comes back, yep. In each area. You know, stuff's gonna stop shooting up when there's plenty of stuff. Yes. You yes. know, there's plenty of cars, cars will go down. But there's still not plenty of cars. There's still a yeah. shortage. Yeah. You know, so that that's what's driving that. So inflation is not a feat or recession is not a feeling. Mm-hmm. It is two consecutive quarters of a shrinking economy. This, you know, it's not a feeling. It's just going to, it is a thing that's going to happen though. This is the Ramsey Show.
Dave here. You can find all of our shows with the Ramsey Network app on your smartphone. It's the only place to listen to the entire back catalog of episodes. Download the Ramsey Network app in your favorite app store today. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, it's the Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host. Rachel Cruz, Ramsey personality, is my co-host. We help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create amazing actual relationships. This is The Ramsey Show. The phone number is 888-825-5225. Mary's in Hartford, Connecticut. Hi, Mary. Welcome to The Ramsey Show. Hi, Dave. Thank you uh, for taking my call, and, and thank you, Rachel, for, for listening in on, on this, too. So my question, my husband and I are in our early 60s, and thank you that um, to you and, and to your plan that we paid off $200,000 um, in two years by selling things, but we, we were debt-free January 1 of this year. Wonderful. So thank you so much for that. Wonderful. Yeah. My, my question, because we hope to retire in the next two or three years, um, I'm nervous about investing in my 401k because every time I turn around, it's going down and down and down. Should I use that money instead, just temporarily, to help pay off our mortgage? No. <laughs> <laughs> How old are you, Mary? 60s, early 60s. Oh, uh, so, uh, no, yeah, early 60s, yeah. I thought you said 36. No, <laughs> early 60s. Um, and we make it. We make a good income. We're about three hundred k before tax. How much we is in your four hundred one k? I have. Um, last I looked, it was three hundred and eighty nine thousand. Okay. What's your total nest egg? And it. And it. M- our, husbands, our yours, total, everybody's. Um. Well, we have forty three thousand in our emergency fund. Mm-hmm. Um, we have probably about another thirty thousand in savings and checking, mm-hmm. and and that's it. It's your our, your four hundred one k is the only one. Your husband doesn't have one. That's right. That's right. You have a pension in our, in our home. I have a small pension. No, does he um, have a pension? No, he does. He does not have a pension. Okay, so you've got four, let's just call it four hundred thousand dollars. And how much is your mortgage? <laughs> okay. Um, our what we have left on our mortgage is three hundred and fifteen thousand. Mm-hmm. Zillow, has, I just looked at Zillow, and it, it is estimated to almost a million, which is a crazy. Love it. Amazes me, but it was yeah. So you're uh, millionaire. Nine hundred ninety-five thousand. Your baby step millionaire. Yeah, I guess. You right, but I'm yeah. nervous about. I, I, I don't want to retire that. with a mortgage. Yeah, good. I don't want you to retire with a mortgage either. So um, let's lay out a plan on the mortgage for a second. Um, how far, mm-hmm. how many years more are the two of you going to work before you want to, how many years have we got to pay off the mortgage? Well, I would, I would like to be able to retire in two years and, and perhaps for my husband, another four years. Okay. And how much of the 300 does he make? He makes 250. Oh, he makes the majority of the income. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes. And so in four years, if you paid off 75000 a year out of 300 income, the mortgage would be paid off, mm-hmm. right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Without so, having to touch yeah, the without, okay. And you could still put 15% of your income into retirement in baby step four. But I want you to put on your, your magic hat again and predict to me when the market's going to rise up again. <laughs> I, I, I can't, but the market's not crashing. <laughs> The market is down 5% in the last 12 months. 5%. 5% is not going to keep you from retiring. As a matter of fact, it means that you're at the store and they just announced a sale over the intercom. The shirt you wanted to buy is on sale, Mary. (laughs) This is not the time to not buy the shirt. 
right. The stock market's uh, I mean, on when it's really down five percent. It's, it's on sale. Too. You don't want to buy it when it's up. You want to buy it when it's down. Okay. All right. It's still it's still scary. But it's fearful. To see that yeah, and my yeah. number go down. You're fearful. It, it is it. scary, but let's understand: five percent of four hundred thousand down is not going to cause you to be able to retire or not be able to retire. You don't have a five percent issue. Okay. If you have a fifty percent issue, if your four hundred went to two hundred, like if you're invested right. in Bitcoin, it's down fifty percent. No, and, and you're no, 400, which you're, you're not crazy, so you didn't do that. But, I mean, you, if you, you, you yeah. would be down to nothing, right? I mean, and, yeah. or you'd be down to half. And so we're not talking about that. We're talking about 5%. And 5% of $400,000 is 8000 bucks. It looks a lot bigger when I look at my statements. It looks so a lot it, bigger when you listen you know, to the news. Keep, I, <laughs> yeah. The news is going to, the the right wing news is going to do everything they can to talk about how horrible the economy is until the fall because they're trying to get the Democrats thrown out of office and they're and the biggest right. thing that can get a politician thrown out of office is the economy. So they're going to talk about inflation, they're going to talk about recession, they're going to talk about high gases, they're going to talk about high interest rates, they're going to talk about how horrible things are and the stock market is crashing. And they're gonna. You, if you keep right. the, if you keep the right wing news on, you're gonna see that from now until fall. Every it's gonna be a steady beat of that for the next six months. You're gonna get a diet of it, and it's gonna drive you bananas. I, also, tur I turn it off. But, and if you watch the left wing news, they lie about it on the other way. So th these things that that you know the right wings are saying are true, but they're they're overstated. Like when a tornado a is coming through, they tell everybody they're gonna die. It's the same thing because they're trying to get sometimes. ratings. <laughs> Okay, but let me say this, though. When she does look at the statement and she sees, oh, that's what we lost, like, it is. It's a punch in the gut. Yeah. So, Mary, though, but what I would encourage you is, you know, well, I mean, she, but she's close to retirement, so she is looking. She's got, she's not going to use the 400 I know, at retirement. So that's what I was going to say, though, is that at that point, you kind of just put it away mm -hmm. and not sit there in this, like, rat race cycle that you have. Let it play out because you're going to still be in the market for another you know two that's, a, that's a good point the, you're not going to use the 400 when you retire yeah you're just going to live off the income it creates right and so if it's up eight thousand or down eight thousand it doesn't matter just keep it okay in. and so watching the statement month in and month out i'm 61 i don't look at my statement mm -hmm. not because i'm emotionally incapable of doing it but i just don't bother because i'm really not going to use that money right now and the current problems in the world are not going to bother me one way or another because that money i'm not going to use it right now mary's in the same situation she's not going to use that money she's going to use the income off of that money right and so i would be more concerned for her if i thought the five hundred thousand or six hundred or seven hundred thousand that that'll be by the time they get to retirement would not create an income for them, yes. If yes. if the uh, if there was not good returns on that to live off of the returns of that money, that would concern me more. Yes. Than the actual amount going up or down five percent. Mm -hmm. It's how much income it. will it create over time? That's what I'm worried about. That's a that's a good way of understanding it. But yeah, Mary, it's normal to do this. I, I just I really turn off the news and I quit looking at your statement every month. And it's not to be ignorant, but it's you're, you're it, it's driving you nuts. And uh, it would probably drive me nuts, actually. I don't. I, I had to turn off the news, and I don't look at my statements. So there you go. This is but the Ramsey Show. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, and prices will still be on the rise. Interest rates are headed up. It may slow down a little bit. Uh, if you're buying a home, you can be up against some heavy competition still. You're definitely going to be up against a hef- hefty price tag compared to three years ago. Plus, higher interest rates means higher mortgage payments. You really need to stick to your budget. To win in any market, you got to know what you're doing, and you need to work with someone who knows what they're doing. Uh, this is not amateur hour in the real estate world. You need a pro in your corner, walking with you, advising you, teaching you. Our endorsed local provider program will lead you to a real estate agent that is the best in the business. As Ramsey Trusted Pros, they care about your values, keeping more of your money in your pocket, and really not being crazy and just doing something that will get you hurt later just in the name of buying a house. RamseySolutions.com slash agent. That's where you can find the ELP, the endorsed local provider for real estate that's Ramsey trusted in your area. RamseySolutions.com slash agent. Our question of the day comes from Blinds.com. They have a 100% satisfaction guarantee. That means even if you mismeasure, you pick the wrong color, they'll remake your blinds for free. You get free samples, free shipping, and with the new promos they run every month, you'll save even more. Use the promo code Ramsey to get the best deal. Today's question comes from Lucas in Maryland. I am currently on in baby step two, working on paying off the remainder of our student loan debt. We have paid at sixty nine thousand, but have a balance of thirty eight thousand. We paid off our home. We make a hundred thousand a year. I have an extensive firearm collection that I could sell off a portion of and pay it off tomorrow, but I'm hesitant to do that as I am afraid I wouldn't be able to replace many of them. Should I sell them to pay off the debt tomorrow or keep moving the way I am and pay it off by December? (laughs) I don't know. Firearms are kind of in your, uh, in your bucket of life. I'm not sure how much I can speak into that. Uh, I have an extensive extensive purse collection. It's a third. There There we go. I okay. will make it make it real. All right, okay. all right. You're you're working with me. Okay. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I would be I would be interested in your take on this because for me, I'm like, okay, you make a hundred grand a year, you have thirty eight thousand, and you have a plan to pay it off by December. You could just keep trucking along. Easy enough, yeah. Easy, I mean, enough, easy enough and pay and, it and off without all. having but to. But the thing I would do is this: in any collection I have, and I'm a collector of things. Oh, we know. I have an OCD <laughs> side to me. I collect used water skis. I collect firearms. I've got. <laughs> I, I'm just like I get. I get off on something. I go down the whole rabbit hole and don't get out. So collector hoarder. <laughs> border, right, in border that, right in that same right along, right that, right along the area. fine line of that yeah kidding. so anyway the um <laughs> this is not about me <laughs> uh so what i would tell you though as one firearm guy to another guy that has an extensive collection i don't know what you mean by extensive collection okay if you have an extensive collection that is worth uh three hundred thousand dollars okay and you can sell off ten percent of it and pay this off today Uh, you probably have 10 percent of stuff around the edges of that collection that you don't care that much about that's that's not in the sweet spot Mm -hmm. those are not your babies Mm -hmm. you know they're not safe queens as we call them and so um the uh you know you but but you know if your entire collection is eighty thousand dollars and you would be selling half of it then you're probably cutting out a little bit of your heart when you do that. So I think that's what you got to ask yourself and just say, okay, is it worth it? Is there some of these items that I care more about being dead on, being out of debt on than I yeah. do the other way? I will tell you this. If, if the numbers were different, if it was going to be an extended period of time, yes, I don't care. Three so, years. Yeah. I, I just, yeah. I'd be selling your stuff, man. Yep. yep. And uh, I will never forget in financial peace university years ago when I was teaching it live with an overhead projector, this Big old guy, he's a linebacker looking guy, completely ripped, probably, you know, 260 pounds, muscles everywhere, blonde headed guy, uh, country boy. Uh, he and his little bitty nurse wife were sitting there, and she starts telling the group what her husband had done to get out of debt, and she's just crying. Mm. And I'm like, what in the world? And she said, he has had this knife collection that was his prize, most prized possession. And um, he sold it for twelve thousand dollars, and we paid off all of our debt last week because he loves. He he said, "I love you and my kids more than I love my knife." Wow. 
and what that spoke to her that it just screamed at her i love you mm -hmm. and and uh, the whole place is just like giving him a standing ovation because that's a man yeah that's yeah. a that's a, that's a grown-up who will sacrifice for the good of the their family just stuff. for their I mean, future and it's it just stuff yep so in that sense if these numbers were different lucas i would be putting you in that category and saying dude sell your guns yeah yeah so your guns. Mm -hmm. They're just guns. I mean, it's just fun. But you, you've got the income, your debt-free house, and yeah. everything. You're down to the last thirty-eight thousand. You're going to get there pretty quick anyway. So I'm not. It's a different discussion. And would the same thing be for like a like I remember being on the show. I think I was with Ken maybe when we were hosting, and a guy had a collector car that he just loved, yeah. loved, loved, loved. And yeah. he's like, I could sell it and be out of debt today, or well, I could be out I, of debt. Again, there's some situations like that. Some collector cars. Okay, my dad and I rebuilt this Mustang 500 hours when I was 14 through 17 years old. I'm 42. You don't sell that car. That's like selling your wedding ring. Yeah. Okay. I wouldn't ask you to sell your wedding ring either to get out of debt. Mm -hmm. But uh, I bought this car a few years ago, and it's kind of fun. You sell that car. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you're in, if you're in, if you've got yourself into a mess because you've, you know, you gave up the right to own something like that because you'd already spent the money. Yes. And, and so, yeah. So, but there's some things that have some nostalgic value. Or if in this firearms collection was a musket from his great grandfather that he used, uh, you know, to protect the fort or what, I don't know, you know, that, whatever you, whatever you, you don't sell that gun. Okay. That's a family yeah. heirloom. That's not a, uh, it's not a collection item. Unless but, it doesn't mean much to you. And it's a family well, heirloom that's just I, sitting I, there and you're you like, I don't you know, really. You don't sell that gun because you'll wake up later and it'll mean something to you. If it yeah. was. Yeah, that that is that you know like well my wedding ring doesn't mean that much to me yeah you're gonna regret that don't do that that's just that, that's gonna come you're you're a little bit too enthused about getting out of debt right now you need to calm down about one notch you know oh. no i mean really you don't sell your the wedding ring. the gazelle has slowed down well you don't the gazelle doesn't sell its wedding ring it just runs okay <laughs> don't stop and sell your wedding ring keep running but yeah <laughs> No, that's good. It's a good. I'm that's gonna, a good. Now, now somebody's going to send me little uh, cartoons no, of gazelles so with wedding rings. People are so mad on. at you. They're but, people um, are so mad at you. No, but it's a good. It's a good. Um, because I feel like getting out of debt is not a balanced thing. You're not balanced when you're getting out of debt. You are doing everything humanly possible mm -hmm. to get out of debt. It's that intensity, and the more you sacrifice. Mm -hmm the faster you're going to do it. And there's that and final 1% that's crazy. And you play crazy. in that, yes, yeah. you plug in that small yeah. human element and say, okay, what's worth it? Okay, since like we're there used the to be a lady. There used to be a lady that had a, uh, a newsletter back when there were paper newsletters mm -hmm. that uh, sh her way of getting money was she, she didn't ever, ever buy anything. She went and got in dumpsters and got stuff out of dumpsters, dumpster diving, okay? I'm not doing that. <laughs> And I'm not recommending people do that, okay? If you want to do it, I'm not mad at you, but that's like homeless people stuff, okay? I'm not dumpster diving because to get out of debt. That's that last 1% of crazy. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm not going in the last Or like 1%. we're going to sell our house and live I'll, in a tent. I'm going to put yeah. you up on 99% crazy, but I'm not going into the last okay. 1%. That's fair. That's and fair. that's selling the wedding There's ring, a... selling the car that your dad and you rebuilt for 500 hours when you were 14. That's uh, selling a, a family heirloom or a special place. Or in this case, it's a short period of time that you're gaining, yeah. an uber short period of time. And so it's, it, you know, I'm not going to sell something that's hard to replace. A lot of guns, you can get another one, depending on what it is. But if you've got a unique piece that's probably one or, you know, one of 50 or something, you're mm -hmm. probably not going to find that one again. Uh, these aren't guns you shoot, people. These are collectibles. Yes. And so, uh, uh, but that's, you know. That, that's it's good. Where I would it's a put good. That. Yep, I think it's great. You I think know. it's a balanced approach, and it's good hearing that perspective because yeah. it gives a look. Because we all have something like that, right? It's like yeah. that human element. So it's good. Great question, Lucas. Appreciate you writing in to us, brother. This is the Ramsey Show.
Thanks for joining us, America. Rachel Cruz, Ramsey personality, is my co-host. Emily is in Rhode Island. Hi, Emily. Welcome to the show. Hi, Dave and Rachel. Thanks for having me. Sure. What's up? Um, So my question for you today is um, I'm in the sixth year of my career, and I've worked at the same company all six years, and just found out that we are being acquired. Um, So I'm wondering what to do with my 401k. I'm I'm keeping my job. Nobody's being laid off or anything. Um, But I have a 401k that I'm wondering if I should move over to the new company's 401k plan or I can roll it over to an IRA. I would roll it to an IRA. Okay. Yeah, get with a SmartVestor Pro at RamseySolutions.com. Find one in your area that has the heart of a teacher. You'll select the mutual funds that you want in your IRA. And when you fill out that paperwork, they you will fill out another piece of paper that allows for a direct transfer. They will send that to your company. Your company will send the money directly to the mutual fund. Do not let them write you a check. Okay. The reason is they have to withhold 20% if they write you a check. And then you have tax problems because you have to put it, you have to roll over 100% or you get into taxes. But if you just roll it, there's no taxes, no money changes hands. It just moves from the old 401k into your thing. So it's under your control. There's 8,000 mutual funds to choose from. And in your new 401k, there'll just be a handful of mutual funds to choose from. And they may be good ones, but uh, and that's you different can, if, it, if her company was bought it's, it's bought which makes it just like she's changing jobs from a 401k standpoint okay and so her old 401k is freed up she's allowed to do with it what she wants you can't move a 401k while you still work at a company mm-hmm. but this company you're not working for anymore because you're working for the new company and so it releases your 401k and gets you going in the right direction so, yeah, that's exactly what I would do. You want to do when you leave a company or when you have the opportunity to get a hold of your money, put it in your control because you have more options and you are in control. And uh, then you can just start your new 401k with your new company and you'll come out better off because you've got it out there. But you got no taxes on this if you do the direct transfer rollover and a smart investor pro can show you how to do that. Sean is with us in Cincinnati. Hey, Sean, how are you? Um- Hey, good. How are you, Dave? Great. How can I help? All right. So we uh, just started doing the baby steps correctly about six months ago. We're in baby step three. And we, so my wife is three months pregnant, with, or I'm sorry, nine months pregnant with our third son. Oh, wow. Congrats. And thank you so much. So we have 11000 in our emergency fund right now. And Friday evening, uh, they were in a car accident. Everybody's doing fine. Wow. Um, that's scary. Car, it was super scary. But Nine months, months pregnant, a car accident. Ouch. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was intense. But, but everybody's good. Yeah, they're rear-ended. Um, my wife's feeling better. Baby's fine. The boys are fine. But um, so our car, it's an O2 Blazer. Low, uh, it has 114,000 miles, little miles. It's a nice car, but insurance is only going to give us about $1,100 for it. <clears throat> and I wanted to know, to know how much to spend on a new car, a new family car, I guess. Man. So you were driving an $1,100 car? Yeah, I mean, to us, it's, you know. No, I'm not asking about you. I'm asking what the car would sell for. Uh, The car, so it was totaled out. I know. By our insurance I know. company. I, I got that part. I'm it. saying before the wreck, what well, the car would have sold for $1,100. Um, uh, maybe I'm thinking like 5,000 because we thought about selling it to upgrade. Okay. Um, Stop a second. Yeah. Cause your insurance company has to give you the market value of the car. Okay. Not what they want to give you. Okay. They, you're under, you have a contract with them called an insurance policy and they're required okay. to pay you what it takes to replace the exact car that you had. So the question is, what was that car worth actually what could suit you have actually sold it for not what it's worth for you but if you put it in uh, you know on trader.com mm-hmm. or craigslist what would it have sold for so right at about 5000 i saw some at 6000 then, then why in the world 4, would you accept $1100 i i just i've never been in the situation have you already accepted the $1100 I have not. Good, the don't. Collision company called me and they said, "No, I'm not you know, taking. I'm not taking eleven hundred dollars." Look, okay. and, and here's the thing: you have to make the case 
in logic, not in feelings, of why that car is actually worth that. Here's three other cars for sale on Trader.com that are identical. Okay. This car is worth $5,000. If you don't pay me $5,000, I'm going to get an attorney and sue your butt. Okay. So I would go kind of hard nose with my insurance company. Yep. Um, would I contact the guy who hit us, his insurance company at all? Or do I? Do well, they're the ones that are supposed to company? pay it. His insurance company should pay it. Okay. Uh, they should be making you the offer, not yours. Okay, perfect. Yeah, they right, have well, to replace you. your car. Appreciate now, it. You're, you don't get to make money on the transaction. And I, oh, I love the car and I change the oil. And I don't give a crap about all that. What would the car actually have sold for before the wreck? That's what they need to write the check for. Follow me? Follow you. Now, once we got that, now let's say we've got three or $4,000 in our pocket. Let's go back to your question. Your question mm -hmm. is, what kind of car should we buy? Did you say you're in mm -hmm. baby step two paying off debt? No, we are in three. Okay. How much money do you have? We have about 11000 That includes your emergency fund? That is. Our, we're building up the emergency fund. Okay. This is an emergency. Yeah. 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 I would take the insurance money and add three or 4000 to it if I were in your shoes. Okay. And so you're buying probably a seven, $8,000 car, something like that. Okay. Perfect. All and Sean, right. I don't know if that, I, I don't know if this it. helps. Uh, I just yep. had a girl on my show talking about cars because mm -hmm. she this is like what she does, and she was talking about how the sedans that have been built even in the last eight years, the back seat of them can actually now your trunk space is one thing, but to hold three kids because I feel like there's this thought out there once you have three kids you have to have an SUV or you have to have mm -hmm. a van, mm -hmm. and so even looking at a larger sedan just for the time period now once now once little ones out of a car seat you know or in a front facing car seat all that you may want you're going to want more room but for the time being mm -hmm. Sean you may even look at a sedan because your SUVs and your vans are naturally going to be more expensive just to get you guys okay. through this stage. So that's just a thought. She mentioned that on the show, and I thought that's a great point, that even some sedans still are they're built big enough yeah. to hold three in the back. It's not going to be comfortable. It's not ideal. But if you guys need something for now and you can't find an SUV because they're just so expensive this for that is, price and, range. And this is just until, you you know, you might drive this car six or eight months. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then cause okay. you may, you know, once you get your emergency fund back in place, you may save up and move up again a little bit in car, right? Right. And that, that's really, so this time next year, you're probably out of the car that you buy now. Okay. Perfect. That's probably right, well, where you're at. What's your income? Uh, about 60. Okay. All right. Yeah, that, that's what I'm going to do in your case then. Now, one more time I want to recast, okay? I'm not telling you to mm -hmm. just be abusive to the insurance company or to try to take advantage of them. I merely want you to get what your car was worth. And if you'll approach it with logic, like you had to go into court and prove to the judge that your car was mm -hmm. worth something. You'd have to have evidence. And so, like, okay. here's three advertisements in Trader.com. Here's one on Craigslist. Kelly here's, Blue what, Book? here's what Kelly Blue Book says the car was worth. Um, you know, and here's how it was equipped, and you're leaving this off. I've done that in several situations and increased the settlement in almost every case because insurance companies are notorious for lowballing you. Okay on the settlement. And so I'm again, I'm not I don't want you to get ten thousand dollars for a car that's worth two. That that's that's immoral. I'm not asking you to cheat somebody. But I am saying you need to get what's due and the way to properly negotiate that is to show actual evidence and, and then just tell them, if you guys don't do this, the judge is going to make you do it. And because here's the actual evidence and if I have to get an attorney, those fees are going to be added on top of it. So let's just do the right thing and replace my car. The guy hit my nine-month pregnant wife. You really don't want to piss me off here. This is The Ramsey Show.
Our scripture of the day is Proverbs 12, 11. Those who work their land will have abundant food, but those who chase fantasies have no sense. Abraham Lincoln said, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I will spend the first four sharpening the axe. Ah, ah. There you go. There you go. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Rachel Cruz is my co-host today. Alex is with us in Utah. Hi, Alex. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi there, Dave and Rachel. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. How can we help? Um, so I guess sharpening the axe, I'm here <laughs> trying to plan for the future a little bit. I'm planning on buying a home um, in the next couple months. And um, I mean, I don't really have any need or desire to live by myself necessarily. And also I'd like to have renters for some income as well. Um, and I'm just trying to figure out how to understand um, separating the kind of personal expenses and business expenses for my rental company, rental property, um, specifically with tithing. Um, I've heard you say before that, you know, for profit and lot profits for uh, business is what you would tithe on that you actually like are given to you as a person that you take out of the company. Um, but on the personal side, it seems like you typically tithe just anything that's coming to you as your income. And so I guess I'm just trying to understand how you might separate that out with something like a property that kind of serves both a personal purpose as well as a business purpose. Hmm. I'm not sure. I mean, if you rent out to roommates, what your expenses that are deductible are, if you're living in so another I mean, part of the house. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, it'd be things, you know, like utilities, HOA fees, homeowners insurance. Things yeah. A percent, that, I guess a percentage you know, of those. Expenses. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be a hundred percent, but you know, whatever the square footage, let's say you're renting out uh 20% of your house, then 20% of your HOA fee would be deductible as an expense, I guess. And so, um, I guess you would you probably just keep a little spreadsheet on that, honestly, and say, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm charging whatever thousand five hundred bucks or whatever you're charging and uh here's my expenses and here's my net profit per month and that's also going to be for your taxes as well to calculate your income tax um and then would with other expenses that are you know um deductible whether or not it's a business something like you know your mortgage insurance um your interest property taxes with those kind of things that normally if it was just my own house that i would tithe whatever my income was and then yes. pay for that anyway yeah. and then i would just consider that the same way yeah I, I i always just say whatever is taxable or whatever whatever i can charge off as a business expense you know mm -hmm. creates the taxable income and your mortgage interest is not deductible uh in in terms of against your uh as an well, the interest is deductible. The payment is not deductible. So if you right. want if you want to yeah. charge it off, and the charge off part of it, and you want to keep it for tax purposes, that's an easy way to f to calculate your tithe. If you're being real technical about the tithe, um, uh, honestly, in that situation, if I was doing all that calculation just to figure out the tithe, yeah, I would just wet finger in the air and then add some to it because you can't mess up being too generous. And uh, so I didn't have to fool with the math. But if you're going to do all the math for tax purposes anyway, then just use that number for your tithe. Your taxable income before you pay taxes on it is what I tithe on. And uh, you can do a Bible study a lot of different ways and argue about this and all that. And I, I'm not going to argue about it. It's God wants people to be generous. He wants us to, those of us that are followers of Christ, to uh, be giving and steadily giving and a tithe is an indicator of how to do that uh but i i don't spend a lot of You're not legalistic about it i don't get legalistic about it i i give a lot more than a tithe uh to to uh local church and to various ministries and various things through our foundation so i'm not worried about you know whether i made it or not you know kind of thing and and so um because i just just because i believe generosity is a spiritual principle mm -hmm. Uh, but, but if you want to do all the calculation, you know, just to make, you know, to feel, feel like you're doing it correctly, there's nothing wrong with doing that. It's not a bad spiritual exercise, uh, to do that, but you might as well do it, use it for your taxes anyway, if you're going to do all that. Anthony's in Houston. Hey, Anthony, welcome to the Ramsey show. Hi, uh, how are you guys doing? Great. How can we help? 
Uh, so I've just got a question. I don't really know where to go from where I'm at. I don't have any debt. I've got two credit cards, but I don't want to cancel them because it'll kill my credit, and I don't really have a problem just letting them sit there. Um, I mean, what should my next steps be? Would it be down payment, an emergency fund, or uh, yeah. how should I work it? Yeah, it's a good question. Well, number one, you know, we, we're not that concerned about the credit score, honestly, Anthony, because you can still get a mortgage without a credit score using man- manual underwriting. And then most of the time, why you need a credit score is to go deeper in debt. So we're not too worried about the credit score over here. So we would advise, and I would say just, yeah, I would go ahead and just cancel it out, cancel the credit cards, get them off the plate, um, and then start saving for your fully funded emergency fund of three to six months of expenses. You gonna keep borrowing money, Anthony? No. And what do you need a credit score yeah, for? Okay, fair enough. And my girlfriend who I do plan to marry has enough saved up to be our emergency fund. So could I take advantage of that and just go full bore towards down payment on a property? I would just start saving. I would save for your own emergency fund. And then when you guys do actually get married, then you guys will have a lot of money saved. And you can allocate some of it to an emergency fund and and some some of it over the down payment. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to decide that today. Just have a big old pile of money. Yeah, I would keep, I would keep, I mentally would keep it separate, Anthony, um, from her just to say, hey, here's my, here's my baby steps, what I'm doing. She can do hers. And then when you guys get married, you can buy it all. And then you'll have a huge jump start, which is awesome because you'll probably have your fully funded emergency fund and a great down payment once you guys get married. Mark is with us in Daytona Beach. Hey, Mark, welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi, Dave. Hi, Rachel. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. What's up? Uh, Dave, I'm a federal employee. I'm an air traffic controller for the FAA, and uh, my wife and I are baby steps four, five, and six. I contribute to the Roth TSP. Um, I don't know if you know or not, but air traffic controllers are required by law to retire at 56. And yep. So in the government's infinite wisdom, they <laughs> won't let me touch that money until I'm 59 and a half. Right. Um, high stress right job. Now, yeah. Do what? I oh, said a yeah, high stress it. job. Yeah, that's what I hear. Um, <laughs> the, uh, so as of right now, we have a pension. I'm, you know, I'm eligible to, to retire in a little less than 11 years. I'm forced to retire in a little less than 17 years. I don't want to say that I'm banking on having that pension. Yeah, it would be nice. But do you have any other recommendations of, of somebody in, in a unique situation such as myself? Yes. As of not maybe putting some money towards traditional as Correct. A, as opposed to all of it towards yeah, the it's, rock. It's called, it's called bridge investing. And it's, it's okay. investing to bridge between 56 and 59. And to have a nest, a nest egg that will do that. And it's just simple mutual fund investing. Uh, so we tell folks to put 15% away in baby step four. You're probably aware of that, right? Right. In your case, I would take 10% of that 15%. How much have you got in your TSP now? Uh, I try not to look at it as a late, I think probably between 180 and 200. And then we have another hundred or so. And you got 17 years to go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you're going to have seven, $800,000 in there. If you don't add anything to it, if you're in the C, the S and the I, like we teach people to do. And you're going to be adding to it because I'm going to tell you to keep putting 5% of your income in there. But I'm going to take 10% of your income and build a really nice nest egg outside of the TSP and uh, get in touch with one of our Smart Vester pros, and they can help you do that. There's some processes in mutual funds you can use that have just come out in the last few years that allow you to invest in capital gains oriented, low turnover type mutual funds where you don't pay taxes on the growth unless you pull it out. And so you can just roll it in, let it grow, let it grow, let it grow, let it grow. You're looking for those types of things. You need a tax-advantaged type mutual fund, low turnover ratio type mutual fund. Talk to one of our Smart Vester pros, and they can help you do that. It's called Bridge Investing to do this. Good call, Mark. Good call. And thanks for keeping us safe in the air. That puts this hour of the Ramsey Show in the books. We'll be back with you before you know it. In the meantime, remember, there's ultimately only one way to financial peace, and that's to walk daily with the Prince of Peace, Christ Jesus. If you want to do your debt-free scream live on the show, visit RamseySolutions.com slash debt-free scream. We'd love for you to come to Nashville and tell Dave your story. That's RamseySolutions.com slash debt-free scream. 